G'day everybody and welcome to today's masterclass with me uh, and Daryl the Broy. It's going to be a really, really good one. Uh, we're getting the hang of some new technology today with Webinar Ninja. So uh, there may be a few sort of learning uh, gaps as we go, but do me a favor. If you're out there and you can hear me and my voice is loud and clear, just head over to the chat box and just pop something in there that lets me know uh, that you're here and you can hear me. And we'll just give people a few minutes to sort of jump in and then we'll kick this off. Bruce, lovely, Elisa, Elisa. Matt's here, dude, this is awesome. David, Nobby, Anthony, welcome. Brian, okay, that's awesome. Okay, because I was looking at the uh, the list and I was like, oh, I can't see anybody there, but this is absolutely perfect. Okay, let's get this show on the road. I'm just gonna turn my mic on because you're here and I'm here. Welcome everybody, thank you so much for joining me. I am loving being back and doing this, uh, the master classes. It's been way, way too long and uh, I wanna thank everybody for coming here. We, we had a great one last week with Debbie French um, and this one's gonna be just as, as good, if not uh, better for a whole bunch of other reasons. Um, do me a favor, one of the things I love about these sessions is I love to be able to slide, slide them the wrong way but steer them in the direction that they need to go. So you're obviously here for a reason and there's certain things you want to know or hear about. And I'd love to be able to sort of put those questions and steer the conversation in a certain direction. So would you just take a moment and head over to actually, we'll do this in the question box because uh, that means people can vote for certain questions. If you put them in the chat box, it's great. You can have a talk between each other. But apparently in the questions functionality, what you can do is you can put a question in there uh, and then we can upvote them or downvote them, and also we can we can tag when we're answering them, which is really good for the replay. So I'd love to know uh, from each of you. You know, today is about value. It's about tr pricing transitions. It's about how to talk about these things. But what do you want to get out of it? What's the one thing that if, if we didn't talk about it or we didn't address it or cover it, that you'd be sitting there going, oh, "Stu, you kind of didn't didn't get what I wanted out of it. I didn't you know get the the thing that I needed to talk about." So. I want to know what's the one question you've got, what's the one area you'd like to focus on, what's the one piece of insight or information or the problem you'd like to solve uh, off the back of this webinar. Does that make sense? So jump in there, let me know what yours is. Uh, and that would be excellent. All oh, right, okay, that's how that works. All right. Jen, welcome. How are you doing? There you go. I'm working this out as we go. So what's the number one thing you'd like to know, hear about? Uh, discuss, pop it in there. Okay, chat box here, we can do it that way. Good, good, good. Uh, hey, hey, Jen, uh, just let me know. Again, I want your insight, I want your input. There we go, it's coming in, it's coming in now. Let me know what you want. Brian, Anthony, Nobby, Lisa, I definitely wanna know what you wanna get from. And if it's just here to listen, that's a totally cool answer too. Who else we got? Kim, welcome. Uh, Tim and Kim, welcome to you both. Uh, who else have we got? David, welcome. Jared, what would you like to get out of it? Come on, guys, give me some, give me something to work with here. Great, Brian, get the message across to clients that we are adding value. I think we can do. Well, I know we can do that. That's definitely something we're going to do. If it's not working in the in the question box, feel free to jump across and give me it in the chat box. But I want to know what's the thing that you want to talk about today. Uh, I'll give you thirty more seconds, and then uh, we'll kick in. Tim, thank you so much. Clearly articulating value. Oh man, we can do that. And and I think doing it in the context of a pricing transition is it's one of the more interesting times to do it because ultimately to make a successful pricing transition, you, you you've kind of got to rely on the fact that you're either already adding value, or uh, alternatively, um, yeah, you, you 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 can demonstrate value. Kim, thank you so much. Oh, that works. Every tip on selling fees based on value without saying due to government etc. costs rising. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, Anthony, is the old service models invalid? Gold, silver, bronze, we're absolutely gonna cover that. Okay, guys, keep them coming, because uh, we're gonna jump into it. I'll give you the background here. Um, I first met Daryl many, many years ago in a different life when I was uh, uh, employed at Hillross. Now, Hillross back in those days, it was a very different beast. It was a, a great place to work. Uh, it was very much separate from uh, AMP. We used to joke uh, that AMP, <laughs> that AMP was kind of like King Kong, yeah? And as long as we, as, as, as the, 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 the blonde character, fed, kept feeding King Kong bananas, we'd be fine. Um, but I met a lot of advisors back in the time, really good ones, but Daryl always stuck out at me as, as someone who is particularly good at what he does. And uh, he's the author of a book. Uh, he is a voracious learner. 
Uh, he's also very passionate about advice, and he runs a really great business in Hill Ross, Hill Ross and Hill. Great name, by the way. And um, when he sort of reached out and we had, a, had that had a conversation about what he wanted to do and where he wanted to go, do you know sometimes you might experience this with clients, you just have this instant, I really want to work with this person. And uh, sort of everything that's happened since then has kind of just made me more and more excited. And in particular, uh, the thing we're going to talk about today is when we sat down and sort of talked about where the business was and analyzed, it became clear um, that one of the things we needed to do, almost the first thing we need to do is, is, is really get on the right track with, with pricing. And the interesting thing is before we even, <laughs> even finished doing the model, um, Daryl and Kirsten and Stephen and the team had kind of just, they'd gone off and they implemented it. And since then, it's just been more and more. So what I want to do is I want, I want, to, I want to give you the opportunity to learn from, from someone who has really knows what they're doing, has done this really, really well. But more than that, uh, has you know has gone has more I think it's has has more exposure to really smart people and has integrated them so everything he's doing is just a combination of that he's got so much value to offer so much to to give so let's just jump into this and uh, get this show on the road Daryl are you there are you there let's get you live you there. I am Stu. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. I've just got to get your camera, camera. camera on. Let's get there. We go. Beautiful stuff. How are you? Let's stop that sharing. Yeah, pretty well, thank you. Yourself? Yeah. You had a good start to the morning. Yes, always. Now you're you're pretty active, aren't you? <laughs> What's your morning routine look like? Oh, the morning routine is getting up and getting to work. Um, I do all my uh, activity at lunchtime and after work. Yeah, you know, some people are morning people. Yeah. I didn't. Use, I used to be an evening person, but I've kind of moved into to morning. Um, how are you? I mean, I know you've you've sort of um, like all of us. You've had a lot of your plans for the year kind of condensed down. Have you got a big Christmas plan ahead? Uh, having some time off before a big twenty-two. Man, it's, uh, I think everybody should take a big, long, extended break over Christmas. But uh, I know I'm needing it. Hey, man, thank you so much for 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 the opportunity to talk about this today. Pleasure. Um, I, when, I know when we were talking about this, and I was just like, there's so many things we could talk about because, I mean, the, the writing the book, the experiences you've had sort of through MDRT, I mean, you've, 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 write, you've built a great business down there. There's, there's so much we can talk about, but I really wanted to dive into this value in this transition and that superpower you have of literally, you can mention the client's name and you go, okay, this is where they started. This is what we did for them and this is where they are. It's, it's very, it's, it's impressive. Um, for those of you that don't, maybe haven't met you or, God forbid, haven't, haven't heard you, can you give us a bit of the, the five-minute background of, of who you are, what your business does, who you help, that sort of stuff? Um, I joined uh, the financial planning world back in uh, the late 1990s, uh, fortunate enough to join uh, Retire Invest back then. Uh, Retire Invest were a leader in actually offering service packages to clients, despite the fact that you know back then it was pretty much a commission model, a product selling model, uh, but they had this uh, ongoing servicing, which really has been, um, I guess, the um, backbone of the entire business in the you know, 20 odd years that I've been doing it. And um, when all the new regulations came in and you had to demonstrate you were servicing and adding value to clients, that ongoing care package at RetireVest um, actually made us um, uh, offer clients and then work towards um, for clients, um, really held us in good stead um, during, you know, initially FSR, then FORFA, and now, of course, first Royal Commission. Um, so we were always focused on service delivery and making sure that we can help people with Centlink and uh, help people with their investments and, you know, whatever, yep. rather than the model that was uh, predominant at the time, which was, you know, get as many people through the door as possible, uh, sign them up and then move on to the next person. And they were the firms that were really, you know, doing a lot of revenue because it was, you know, a volume-based operation. We didn't really head down that path necessarily. It was more about relationships, not knowing that, you know, 20 years down the track, the relationships we embedded at the time would really serve us in spades, meaning it got us through the, through the Royal Commission. And when we had to increase prices, clients could actually see the value we delivered right through the journey and did not have any 
um, problems with you know giving us an increase of the fees we're sort of looking for yeah. uh, to make our servicing viable for them. So retiring vests are really interesting because um, they were probably one of the first licensees to really have a crack at owning a brand in the space. What was your what was your take on that? Was it how successful was it? How easy was it, particularly at the beginning? To so obviously it's a retirement proposition. What was it like to be on the inside of that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's amazing how how the brand attracted a certain type of person to the organisation. Um, so pre-retirees and retirees were pretty much drawn to the brand. Um, and if you think about it, back then when there was less money than there is now, mm. um, the retirees and pre-retirees were the ones that actually had uh, the fairly large amounts of money uh, to invest. So it was a it was a brilliant strategy from that point of view. We didn't have too many accumulators coming in. Okay. Uh, the brand didn't attract accumulators. And in fact, they tried to extend the brand by bringing in another, another offering called Future Wealth. Okay. But, of course, the money from the advice uh, perspective, because we were paid on trailing commissions, yeah. uh, really in the pre-retiree and retiree end of the market. So um, I'm, I'm really keen to go into a bit of the journey and sort of where it's where it's developed. But um, where you're at now in terms of the target market you work with and, uh, you know, the client, how far away is it from, from where you started? I've added one area to the target market and, and essentially the pre-retiree, retiree end of the market has continued uh, in my career, but uh, we've seen an opportunity in the successful uh, business owner market, um, okay. where we're running successful businesses um, where they're dealing with complexity, the accountants and the lawyers are doing certain pieces of the work but um, they've got superannuation needs, they've got investment needs, they've got surplus cash coming in that has to be looked after. And hence, of course, me launching my book back in uh, 2013 and launching a separate brand. Uh, funnily enough, of course, the, uh, the compliance work in the, in the interim um, and uh, the fact that we're getting a lot of referrals into the pre-retiree and retiree into the market has meant that I haven't done as much work in the small business space as I would have wanted to, uh, but that's you know not a bad problem to have. Um, Ramon, is it the Bulletproof Business? Was that the name of the book? Sorry, Chef. The name of the book? Um, business Ownership Bulletproofed. That's right. Business Ownership Bulletproof. Actually, it's it's available on Kogan, would you believe? <laughs> I'm not going to that. Like, oh, Amazon, Amazon is where I'm making all my sales, but I'm not making a lot of money selling the book. Uh, it's yeah. basically positioning me as a, as a person of authority in that space and giving people who buy the book a bit of an understanding in terms of how we can add value to them. So, I mean, it'd be keen to understand a little bit about sort of the journey you went on there. You were with Retire Invest for a period of time, and that would have yes. been a fairly, was it a prescriptive business model, or was it was it very much up to you to build what you wanted? Yeah, very much prescriptive. I mean, no. you had the service package, you had to de deliver the service package. That's what people were buying, the ongoing care program. Um, and, and look, I mean, that, that was a great base to work with. We um, then moved out of Retire Invest in 2005 and set up an independent license uh, then with um, hand-picked uh, franchisees from Retire Invest. Oh, wow. Um, and we had 13 offices uh, nationally, 35 advisors at the peak. But um, a lot of the guys um, at the time were coming up for retirement and they could see the writing on the wall after the GFC and the reforms uh, the Labor government was going to bring in. And they decided we were going to be too small to survive. And they looked for a large merger partner. Um, the business was tendered, uh, mm. about 23 licensees um, the tires, and um, the 24 shareholders in the company decided that at the time, Hill Ross was the best fit for us. What was that like? I mean, it's interesting because it almost feels like, so you must see this, that the industry seems to go from one extreme to the other back and forward. And we're now even now seeing the rise of sort of these small, I call them the small giants, small groups of business that are coming together, different brands, but they, they've got similar values. What was it like to have you know, 13 offices, third advisors? Did it work? What didn't work? 
It was fantastic because we had a great team in head office, people we trusted to run a really slick operation. And we partnered with um, other advisors who had the same philosophy, um, you know, were people who had a clean record. And we knew that in the new world, um, you know, would be reliable and didn't have any issues or problems. So we weren't looking to be a mass market offering where we would sign up hundreds of advisors, um, good, bad or indifferent. Uh, we were really particular in who we'd take on board. Okay. And then you moved to Hillross. How did that, how, how did that, was that a big change? Massive change. I mean, look, we've been with the institution uh, being uh, Retire Invest, um, Mercantile Mutual ING, um, you know, from the time I joined to 2005. So we knew what a big organisation was like. Um, I mean, AMP, um, Hillross, um, of course, AXA came in during uh, our acquisition, it became the biggest in the market. I think that about 4,000 advisors back in 2011 when the uh, AXA merger was completed um, mm. was, was a much bigger beast, um, a lot more, um, I guess, prescriptive than even Retire Invest was. Uh, and, and we knew what we were getting into. I mean, you know, um, that was the environment uh, that we'd um, signed up for and, you know, things were fine. So obviously, um, from the time sort of we knew each other, Bill Ross was very much a, I wouldn't say it, was a, it, wasn't, it wasn't an open architecture, but there was definitely the opportunity to sort of build a proposition. It was the same brand, but it was, it was, it was kind of very, um, it was very separate from AMP. Between sort of the time when, you know, we knew each other back then to the time we started working, what was the evolution of the business, the team? How did things change? Like any large organisation, Stu, uh, you know, organisations uh, evolve. Um, you know, they were responding to uh, regulatory changes, and um, you know, initially the the journey was quite good, like any other uh, licensee. But then, of course, once um, you know there was a call for the Royal Commission, and some of the issues started coming to the fore. Um, you know, the organization's uh, requirements did change and, uh, you know, we were impacted like everybody else in the licensee. Yeah. So what was the, I mean, you, you'd done pricing exercises before, before we met. I mean, this is not the first time. But when you, when we sort of sat down and, and we had that conversation and we started talking about pricing, um, the one thing, I, the one sense I got is that you already knew that you needed to do something. Talk to me about sort of, what, how you how you made that realization? I guess why you hadn't done it previously. <laughs> um, it's pretty funny, Stu. Uh, I think we all realize what we need to do, but uh, we need a catalyst or we need a bit of an impetus to get us to do what's required. Uh, I'm an avid reader, as you mentioned at the start. Um, you know, read IFA magazine, money management, and everything else that's going around, and um, you see what competitors are doing. You see what your peers are doing, and there came a realization that we had to start doing something on the pricing side. I did mm. something minor in about 2015, but you know, it wasn't wasn't huge. Um, the thing that was important was that I was looking at uh, the zero monthly management accounts that were being pumped out every month, and of course, you know, the figures um, were indicating a certain story. Right, um, our revenue was flat, and the profit was coming off. Yeah, and um, it was like a rabbit in the headlight. We had to do something. What do we do? Uh, and clearly, we had to start increasing our prices. Now it was easy for new clients coming in the door. Yeah, price accordingly. But then you had this huge legacy book you had to do something with. And if you think about it, we've got a lot of clients who are um, in in retirement, drawing down their capital. And of course, if it's a uh, fee based on funds under advice, then the fee line is pretty much coming down. Yeah. Um, can I can I share the comment? Because it was a weird conversation, and it's it, it's an interesting one. How often certain businesses have exactly the same profit gap? And I remember we had this conversation. And by the for, for anybody who's done this, you'll know that when you generally do a pricing model, you run through it, and there's a point at which you kind of spit out a number. And then you spend a bit of time kind of playing with it and doubting it and pushing it and prodding it and can we do this? And then you reach a point where you go, oh, okay, that's obviously what I need to charge. Otherwise, I need to change my business. And usually you take that model 
and you use an analysis tool and you put all your clients what they're paying and then you go through a process and at the end it spits out a number. And then it produces, it basically produces your number that says this is what you're giving away each each year. And it, I think it's a fantastic thing to put up. But it for you guys it was it was a, it was a, it wasn't an insignificant number, right? And it also explained why one of the things that was happening is you guys were working really, really, really hard. Yeah, but it was a six-figure number, as you said, in the uh, masterclass information that was sent out, uh, Stu. So, I mean, you couldn't walk away from it. Uh, it was large. It was real. And it wasn't, wasn't getting any better. I mean, one of the strategies we used to try and cover that gap was to actually put more clients on. But then that became harder because the compliance regime became extremely tough and putting on more clients wasn't really the answer because you get more people to service mm. and under the regulations you had to make sure that you know under your um uh, annual servicing that you you know provided all the services you committed to in in the soa and of course if you missed anything then you saw what happened in the royal commission um you know the, yeah the, the service issue um so that wasn't really a, a long-term solution. And a lot of the literature I was reading at the time was saying, you know, the best financial planning firms have got a profit margin of 65%. And, uh, you know, we at that point in time were sort of struggling to get to 30%. And um, I felt that, you know, why would we be at the bottom end when we need to be, to, to be best practice and be you know, like the more successful firms. So that, that was my driver to um, look at how we could get our pricing up so we could therefore get our profitability to the level that we needed to get it to yeah. so that we weren't, um, I guess, um, buying ourselves a job. And, um, you know, to use your words, when you uh, first were engaged by us uh, running a charity, it's it's I think Michael uh, Kitsis actually wrote it and it was a really good observation it's like um, that that giving really good quality advice and being a highly profitable business and not they shouldn't be mutually exclusive in actual fact they're they're, they're actually the same both two, two sides of the same coin because I think we spoke about this and your background in business with you know with businesses or see that one of the major reasons why businesses often go down the wrong route or do the wrong thing or get into trouble is because they're under financial pressure and if you don't have time to provide the advice to service the clients because your pricing model is not right, then suddenly you, you've got this kind of downward spiral, the, the, the slow death. I wanted to ask, because you, I mean, I remember we did the pricing and sometimes, like sometimes when I do that, you know, there's a period between the, the models there and the, let's start launching it where people just need to, need to play with the numbers, they need to put them in a spreadsheet, they need to kind of test the waters. You and the team were just like, okay, that's what we're going to do. Tell me, why, why was that transition so much faster for you than it, than it is for most businesses out there? Well, the first thing you did, Stu, was set a target of um, what we had to achieve per quarter. So what you did was you took this um, fairly large problem and you chunked it down to bite-size um, uh, dollar amounts and then you set a time frame on it. So we actually had to, if we were honest about ourselves and we had to justify employing you, we had to start living up to what the requirements were. Otherwise, why waste your time? Why waste our time? We could continue to do what we were doing yeah. and not get a different result. Um, so once you set the challenge uh, to us, we all knew we had a problem. We all knew it had to be addressed. Uh, it was then a matter of getting on to the job Hmm. And one of the first things I did was I went back to when clients came on board and had a look at what the initial fee amount was for them when we did the SOA, you know, 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier, whatever it might have been, um, and had a look at the fees we were getting now. And in a lot of instances, they'd actually fallen. Yeah. So the first thing I did when we met with the clients I said back in 2010 when you came on board, these were your fees and your fees now are minus, you know, whatever the number was. And then I'd say to them, you know, in the last 10 years or however long it was, um, prices have gone up, haven't they? 
they've gone up for everyday items, you know, be it petrol, be it electricity, be it gas, be it rates, yeah. whatever, right? But funnily enough, our fees to you have actually fallen, or in some cases they've been static for that entire period. Right. And then I'd say to them, unfortunately, we've now got to increase our fees to you. Um, and when you put it in that context, yeah. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of people would concede, yes, um, it's unusual to see fees fall for such a long period of time, given the fact that the work you're doing for us hasn't changed mm. or might have actually even increased. I want to dive into a little bit more about how you do it, but I think before we kind of do that and get into the conversations and, and, and the mindset and, and the thing that you do really, really well, it's probably worth pointing out that you... You've, you've been a long time learner on a whole bunch of stuff out there. I mean, MDRT, you speak, you know a lot of really smart people. Do you want to give people a bit of context as to what you think have been, you know, the most important habits that you've built up in terms of learning how to do this, how to have the conversations and, and from who? Because we were talking about this yesterday and I think it's really, it's worth sort of going, going into that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Stu, I'm the product of uh, many of my peers who've been generous with their time and their information and really have seriously wanted to help me whenever I've asked them questions or had problems to resolve. And I found that the Million Dollar Roundtable um, has been a pretty good cool source of um, help for me, yeah. uh, either getting onto their website and having a look at their podcasts or their videos, <laughs> or their information papers, attending their annual meetings or you know, mixing with the 150 members in Australia. I mean, it's an international organisation based in the US, which has got 90,000 members from 80 countries around the world. But there are some, you know, great advisors here in Australia that I can, you know, contact and, and run problems past and, you know, who'd be really happy to help me. And um, a lot of that, um, I guess, intellectual property I've picked up being a member for the last 10 years. So one of the things I set out to do was to adopt a lot of the MDRT practices in terms of dealing with clients um, and into my client servicing, into my client annual meetings and so on. I brought a lot of this um, a methodology that a lot of the advisors around the world um, through MDRT are using, um, you know, very simple concepts like um, taking clients from complexity to simplicity through the use of the familiar and what that actually means is in their language um, you know not financial jargon not advisors speak but um, you know how they would articulate uh, articulate a problem so yeah. you know if someone's retiring it wasn't you know we'll set up an allocated pension to give you an income mm. but we need to replace your employment income um, and therefore we'll give you a solution for that. You know, simple stuff like that. And by working in that sort of manner, um, I've been a lot more helpful to my clients. The other thing, for example, MDRT taught me was to get a great network of um, other allied professionals, people like yeah. lawyers, and accountants, uh, general insurance brokers, mortgage brokers, um, you know, property, um, real estate, uh, buyers advocates, and, and so on. So I've built a network of all of that. So whenever a client or their families had a problem, mm. I've been able to refer great people to them, and they've had a great experience out of that. And what that does, in my opinion, is that it increases their, um, I guess, appreciation of what the office and I do for them. So when the fee increase conversation occurred, it was in the context of that last 10 years of really servicing the heck out of these clients. And therefore, they got a huge amount of value. And therefore, price was never an issue because they could see the value we delivered. And just an example, um, a lot of clients have got cash reserves for emergencies. Um, the term deposit rates and the cash uh, bank account rates were coming down for the last uh, five to ten years, and we were always looking for opportunities to try and increase their rates of return. Right mm. now, for example, Macquarie are offering an at call account 1.1% for four months and then 0.95% after that. And I've got clients who've got 
hundred, two hundred thousand dollars that went to bank turned deposits that are now moving to this account. Mm. And on a hundred grand, you know, it's a thousand dollars more. Now, um, that's purely sending them the link, setting up the account online, and they've got an extra thousand dollars. So I'm, I'm, one thing I want to ask is obviously you you have the same time in, in the day like everybody else does at the moment, which is generally less than it was about two years ago. Are you, are you still investing as much time in you know the network stuff? Are you still investing as much time in in, in the, the learning? In which case, how are you prioritizing it? You're right, Stu. Uh, that suffered quite a bit, particularly with the uh, compliance uh, constraints that uh, the licensees had to mm. endure from ASIC and you know, we've had to spend some time uh, fixing. Um, it has become difficult, um, but we, with the really solid base of um, stuff we've done prior to the current COVID issues and so on, um, you know, we've been able to still add a lot of value outside the standard financial planning sort of stuff that we do for clients day in, day out. Okay. So let's, let's dive into the transition. You're there, you're going, okay, we're going to do it. What were the first few conversations like? Did it evolve in the way you did it or did it was it the same from day one? One of the things MBRT has taught me is that if you look at the best actors around the world, they never turn up on stage or in front of the camera and start ad-libbing. They always practice their lines. Okay. Um, so that's one of the things we did. As soon as you said, Daryl, you need to get X dollars in an X period of time from your clients, yep. um, immediately I started to turn to what would the conversation look like? How would I position it? Okay. What would I say? What would happen if the clients <laughs> didn't re react well? And certainly in the early days, I had a bit of pushback, uh, which is to be expected. And then how would I, how would I deal with that pushback? And so when you practice, like, what do you do? Are you, are you in the shower? Is it in your head? Are you in front of the mirror? Yeah, pretty much in my head. Um, okay. So I would work through a process. Um, you know, when, when do I bring it into the conversation? So, for example, it's always at annual review time. Um, a few people I did call up because it was outside the review period. Okay. But I'd, I'd work through my normal review process yeah. I'd then make sure the clients were happy. I'd make sure there weren't any problems we hadn't actually addressed. Put all that to bed. Yeah. Once I knew that there weren't any other issues to cover, yeah. I'd then move on to the fee conversation. And it was positioning by saying, you know, when you became a client of ours back in 2010, this is the amount of money you were paying us. You're paying us blah now. Uh, it's either been a decrease or it's been steady. And as you can appreciate, things have changed um, and we are now having to increase your fees from XYZ to ABC. Okay. And um, you mentioned you had some pushback. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, one of my biggest clients, one of my longest serving clients, um, you know, who's... Um, Farm had increased by eight times in uh, 35 years from, you know, just under a million to uh, more than eight million. Um, she'd had a huge amount of value from us in that entire period. Yeah. Helped family members. Um, and I had to make the call because um, she wasn't coming in for a while um, and she was severely underpaying us. Right. And I rang her up and um, had the conversation. And uh, she was taken aback, I guess, by what I had to say, but said, look, send out the information and uh, I'll make the payment. Um, a few weeks went by, yep. it didn't come through. Uh, we had additional conversations. Um, she said, look, I'm getting a new uh, debit card. I'll, I'll make the payment. Right. And then a few weeks went by and I get a letter from her saying that, you know, she's moving on yeah. um, to someone who uh, would probably charge less than me. Um, how, did that, how did that feel? Because this, was this, this, was rel this was relatively early on in the process, wasn't it? Like, I think it's sort of been about the fourth or fifth conversation. Yeah, within the first few weeks. Okay. Like, how did it make you feel? You hit, like, that's, that's a roadblock that doesn't, you don't usually get that, right? 
It's, like, tough. it's tough because, I mean, um, you know, you've done a lot of work for them. You've added a lot of value to them. Uh, you know you know them really well. Mm. Um, there's never been a problem, never been a complaint. Uh, they've been very happy with the work you've done. They've taken up all the recommendations you've given them in that, you know, 35-year period. No, I, 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 whenever I lose a client, particular, I mean, I, I was working with one business for, for nine years and we both knew, we were like, you know what, it's time for you to, to go on. But when we had the conversation, it didn't matter. Even though it was the right thing, we're like, you need to go and find a new coach. You know, we've been, to, um, it, it, it cuts because it's, it's almost like losing, yeah, it's like losing part of you. So what, what happened in that situation? Because I want to, this is a great story. Well, I mean, I mean, I didn't want to go back cap in hand to her and, and say, look, um, good question. You know, can we talk? Um, can we reconsider the fees? Um, I pretty much held my ground. I mean, you and I had, had a conversation and uh, on one of your sessions, some of your other um, clients jumped in yep. and um, you know, gave me their view on what we should or shouldn't do. Um, and then I was prepared to get the letter from uh, the client saying, you know, Billy Bloggs has now been appointed as my new advisor. Um, you know, please work with him or her and, you know, move the, the money across. That letter never came. And the longer it went on, the more I thought uh, that the client had gone out and seen the alternative and the alternative had a look at her situation <laughs> and were not going anywhere near her current pricing or even yeah. the new pricing that I was suggesting the client move to because of the complexity of the situation and the amount of money at stake. Mm. And in the end, I had a letter about three months after that initial call saying, Daryl, uh, I've reconsidered, um, you know, would you mind taking me back as a client? Mm. And I contacted her immediately, said to her, I'd got her letter. I didn't talk about you know what her experience was with other people if she'd been to see other people yeah and i said you know welcome back as a client and um, we're looking forward to working with you going forward and then of course what was ironic was um i get a letter yes yesterday um apologizing um and um saying she was pretty uh, stupid for even thinking of leaving me given you know all the work we've done for her and her family for many decades and um she's really apologetic for having done what she did it's um it's interesting because i remember having that conversation with you and I, I i like having i know i feel the same way and i, I think we had a conversation and you'd already made a decision and we said you're, you're going to roll out the red carpet now you know and she said, yeah i'm going to roll out the red carpet and it was just this idea that people remember how it starts and people remember how it ends and if you do a really good job at the end and i you and i kind of had a sense that there was other people involved in the decision making process but we also knew that when she went out there and engaged other advisors, she was going to have to pay more to come on board. And this is a key thing, and I probably want to just raise this. If a client's making a decision to disengage with you, it's not a decision about what they're going to gain that you should argue. It's always about what they're going to lose. And I think the realisation is that when she actually looked around, she realised that she was going to lose more from getting a new advisor than she would ever gain. I think that's the key thing. But rolling out the red carpet and, yeah, I, I think it was it's a, it's a great story. Is there any other – was that the main pushback or did you get anybody else who, who sort of gave you some pushback along the way? No, I've had a few other people uh, push back. Um, I had one guy who um, – he, he split his funds. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of money, but he's got more than a million dollars. And – he split his money uh, amongst two advisors. There's another advisor helping him for half the portfolio. Oh, wow. and that's been the case for you know more than 20 years, and he's happy with that arrangement. And clearly, I was being benchmarked against the other advisor. Yeah. So he had a number in his head he wasn't really going to go past. Right. Uh, which is about $1,400 or more than we up. Okay. So the repricing was from $1,800 a year to $5,400 a year, pretty yep. well, right? And again, I went through the entire spiel, I justified it, I provided perspective, provided context, but clearly the other advisor had got in there and set a benchmark. Okay. And that's really what I was competing against. So with that background in my head 
and the fact that he's saving money in retirement and his fund is going to just keep on increasing as it has done for the last 25 years. Um, I pretty much conceded, um, cut $1,400 off the fee increase, but still more than a doubling of what he was paying and agreed to run with $4,000 a year at the minute okay. uh, with the fun increasing, you know, our fee is going to keep increasing in the years ahead. But pretty much meeting um, that doubling requirement uh, or that $2,000 fee increase mm. that we had to um, bring in for that client as we had to do with, you know, many others as well. That benchmark thing is a really good point. Um... And I know uh, it sounds like you know you're you're sort of very mindful of the fact that when when someone's got something in he in hand this, in their head about what something should cost, there's this anchoring thing going on. What what do you do when someone like we, we see the research come out? People think of us at three hundred dollars, and you know that number has come from general knowledge about what accountants charge. Or what do you do when you've got a client in front of you that is anchored to a number like that? They just think it should be, and it's not logical. What would your strategy be there? Yes, yeah, so, so the anchoring um, uh, for a lot of clients is the initial piece of advice you give them and the fees they sign up for. Mm. Um, and then what we're talking about is an increase on that figure. And we were talking on average about $2,000 per client per year was the increase across the entire uh, portfolio. Um, and what I tend to do is I tend to bring that back to something that is relatable, something that's a day-to-day -day issue for a lot of people. Um, the other day, um, a, a client who's on the top marginal tax rate um, wanted to be invoiced for his payments rather than have the money deducted um, from the investments because uh, within the investments, um, it's taxed at 15%, they get a 15% tax deduction, whereas in his personal hands, the tax deduction is 47%. So yeah. the fee automatically, the government gives him a refund for half of that fee. Right. And then, because it's a husband and wife, uh, there's two of them, um, and there's 365 days of the year, Yeah. the fee comes back to $5 per day each, which is about where a cup of coffee is going to head, I think, in the next right. month. It's, do you know what, it's, it's a good strategy. So, I mean, like, it, it works because it's people something familiar to. The other one I, I think I've heard a lot, and it works really well for those of you who are dealing with accumulators, is to turn around and go, okay, do me a favor. Do you pay for streaming? Yeah, I do. I've got Apple TV. Great. How much do you pay for that? About 80 bucks a month. Cool. All right. Do you have a cleaner? Yeah, they come in at my house every week. Okay, how much is that? 80 bucks. Great. Uh, and a gym membership. Great. Yeah, I do. I pay 200 bucks for my boot camp, whatever. And if you add those up, you clean them, it's about four grand a year. Your boot camp's coming in at about two and a half grand. And your streaming, well, it's probably coming in at close to around a thousand bucks. So you know the sums on that. That is what? Uh, Seven and a half thousand dollars a month on sitting on your sofa watching TV, um, basically sweating and grunting so you can look good, uh, which is not a bad thing, but you get the idea. And someone to keep your house clean. And you kind of go, what's the difference between that and, and, getting your financial stuff together. Well, the answer is those three things there are immediate uh, returns. They're, they're, they're instant gratification. Whereas financial uh, investment in financial advice or getting it right, that's going to have a 10, 15, 20 year payoff, but that's going to fix everything else. It's, but it's, it's a good way to anchor. anchor I, I've always felt it's a good example. The, the other bit of anchoring we do, Stu, is to take them back to when they first um, engaged us and look at their journey that we map out. Uh, I've got a big blue board behind me here, but the one in the next office, which we conduct all our meetings in, is massive. And I actually pretty much map their journey out in the first appointment okay. uh, in their words. Um, so it's a very simple diagram where I've got dollars on the vertical axis, I've got time on the horizontal axis, and then I split the time up into the next 12 months, 12 months, five years, five years plus, and then I draw a dotted line on the outside, which is their retirement date, expected retirement date. Um, and I put up at the top right-hand corner of the um, blue board the um, either the lump sum amount they want to get to or the annual income they want to earn in retirement. Okay. Now, on the left-hand axis, the dollar amount is going to be lower 
than on the top right hand part of the blue board, right? Okay. And then, apart from all of the stuff they want to uh, achieve, such as holidays, such as private school fees. You there? Hello, have we lost uh, Daryl or have you lost me? Get the financial number yep. from uh, the lower left hand side to the upper right hand side and effectively guarantee their retirement for you know, 20, 30 years, uh, prevent them running out of money or if their assets are actually falling, then uh, make sure that they get all the government benefits to prevent them running out of money before they run out of life. Um, and you, you draw that? I draw that and I give that to every client, regardless of whether they, um, uh, whether they uh, employ me or not, they get that as a legacy of our meeting. Um, so they've got their map drawn out as at 2021. Yep. I put down the bottom left-hand side of the diagram. Um, all the way through to their retirement age and beyond. So how the, I've always wondered, how does the blue thing work? It's, it's, it's not a TV screen, is it? It's not a TV screen. I've got to use a really thick black texter uh, <laughs> with the contrast on the, on the, on the blue board. Um, I could have had uh, an electronic recording device actually attached to the blue board, but instead yep. what we do is we just take a photo of the, that makes sense. the, the stuff on the board and then we transcribe it onto a hard copy that we store in our uh, CRM and send on to the client via email or hard copy. So there's a few questions I want to sort of put across. Uh, I'm going to put across Tyson's, and I also want to ask you about the superpower before we run out of time. Um, you've got a couple of clients there, one that sort of left and came back, and then you've also got another one that gave you pushback. And, and, and there's usually a case where there's, you know, it's, most clients just, just say, yes, that sounds fine, they move on in the vast majority of cases. But if you, if you think about the clients that um, did give you pushback, uh, in hindsight, would you have approached it differently? Probably not, Stu, because, I mean, that would have meant that I was um, concerned about the minority rather than um, happy about the majority. And, and I guess if three people have pushed back, and all three, by the way, have, have uh, continued, but um, we've had 60 pretty much sign up, there's another 60 remaining through to uh, May of next year. Yep. And a lot of that's already in train anyway. We position the increase for them and um, the paperwork's being signed now. T to me, it validates the positioning. It validates the increase and indicates to me that, you know, we aren't really too far out of the market. I remember us talking and we, and we said, look, um, I think you're going to bank most of that profit gap and you should because... That's it. What, what essentially that, that profit gap you're replacing that with hours and stress and hassle. That's why it's there. I had a conversation just the other day with a business who turned around and said, Our profit's fine, which is working too hard. And I was like, Yeah, that's because you are you're filling the gap. But um, I wasn't gonna go with this. But then we sort of said, Look, at the, even if you lose a few clients, you're gonna get capacity back, which means you can do more of the things. And I think sometimes what you get out of this is you get. You fill a profit gap and you also get some time back. And 90% of the time, the clients who say no, there, might, there probably wasn't a match there anyway. They weren't quite appreciating what you were doing or they were on the wrong, wrong path. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the other thing, Stu, that you've pointed out is our capacity constraints. I mean, you've basically said that we've got capacity for 150 clients ongoing given our staffing and our structure. And we've got to be mindful of that. So you can't really yeah. clog up your system with, you know, too many people at the bottom end. You've got to have that space for the ideal client going forward. You spend a bit of time, obviously, working on the avatars and, you know, yep. the ideal the clients and we've got to start attracting them. Um, but, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think it's it's having the confidence, having the belief um, and... Um, uh, an external accounting firm has recently come into the licensee to work with other practices um, around the country. And uh, I sat in on an initial debrief by the uh, big four accounting firm on some of their findings and where they're taking the pricing for the other offices around the country. And there were two um, other 
uh, AMP practices are presented as part of the um, update, and the numbers were very similar to the numbers that you and I have actually talked about on a per client basis and on a per practice basis. For Kinehanba, you're a, you're a, you're a, you're a practice in a, in a metropolitan area. You're you, you're not inefficient, definitely not. But you're doing things a, a certain comprehensive way. The numbers are going to be relatively similar if you if you look at certain things. There's a certain barrier that you can't go under. I want to, before we run out of too much time. I want to talk about something that whilst we started to talk about the pricing, you just suddenly started. And I've done it a few times. You go, well, this is. And you gave an example today. We started working with this client eight years ago. And at the time, they had a million bucks, and they came to us for this, and this is what we charged them. And this is the advice we put in place. We fixed this, fixed this, and now look at where they are now. And this is something you are able to do in a way that you kind of, you kind of, I wouldn't say you've dismissed it, but you've gone, yeah, I can do that. And it's something that when I have conversations with a lot of advisors, they say, I'd love to be able to have a system where I can have a starting point, an end point, and that could be the basis. But you've almost developed it without the technology. So can you tell us a bit about how you do this? Has it always been something you do? Do you track it in the background? We report to clients on a uh, quarterly to six monthly basis in terms of their numbers. Yep. And I check the investment reports before they're actually sent out. And it's amazing, Stu. I mean, after having done it with the same clients for decades, um, the numbers start to stick in my head. I've, I've got this uncanny ability to uh, remember these facts and figures. And um, I've started accounting, but never uh, worked as an accountant. Um, and I remember cramming for accounting exams and remembering a lot of the, you know, the balance sheet profit and loss stuff um, by just absorbing it like a sponge and just regurgitating it on the exam paper to get me through. Um, so maybe it's just, you know, some innate ability that I've got. Um, helps me remember and understand but it's not all about the numbers you know it's it's about working with them as people understanding them intimately in terms of their interests their family their mm -hmm. friends their activities their hobbies and spending some time talking to them about that not about the numbers the numbers help them achieve all of that stuff so the numbers are really important but I always engage them on a personal basis. Yeah. And because I've done that, um, a lot of these people become friends. I mean, like I had lunch with a client the other day um, and I have a lot of lunches uh, with um, my clients. And I had a client who I contacted yesterday for review. Unfortunately, his health's not fantastic. Um, you know, he's looking at an end of life situation, which is really sad. But, you know, at the end of the discussion, he said, look, Daryl, um, you know, I thank you for everything you've done for me. Um, he said, I remember my wife and I walking to your uh, office for the first appointment. I just retired at 70 and uh, she was concerned about running out of money. And when we walked out of that appointment, mm. um, running out of money was not something she was concerned about. Now, unfortunately, she has predeceased him and their financial situation is similar to what it was when they walked in the door 13 years ago and financial markets have been really kind in the meantime. But I mean, here was a guy where Centrelink stuffed up, um, he missed out on the Kevin Rudd payment uh, of $1,000 each back in 2008. Um, I, I argued with Centrelink, took him to the uh, Social Security Appeals Tribunal, lost the case there, took him to his local member of parliament to try and fight for the $2,000. Not that he needed the money, but it was more in principle, and we ultimately ended up having to walk away because all of that didn't work. Yeah, he saw the effort I went to, and I didn't charge him anything more for that. Mm. Um, but you know, he sent me clients. His son is a really successful stockbroker, and his son keeps saying to uh, this client, he said, "Dad, if you came and worked with our firm, our fees are going to be double what Daryl's actually charging." <laughs> bargain. <laughs> Uh, but it's not. It's, yeah, it's not about that, really. Is it? It's not just the, just the. That's that's awesome. Um, I want to ask. You have got some really good questions coming up. So, but I want to know where are you, where are you at now with the pricing? I think you. I mean, last time we spoke, you said you're about fifty percent of the way through. Is that correct? Yeah, we're more than fifty percent. So effectively, what we've done is we've repriced half the book. Uh, there's a lot more in train, obviously, coming up in the lead up to Christmas. 
we think that by the time we get into January, we're 75 percent of the way there, and then we'll get the other 25 percent across the line, you know, by May next year, and we might even head back and look at doing more repricing with the people we've already repriced in the first six months of the year. And in terms of um, the the number, I think that's what your question is, Mike. Did you want to give us either? I mean, you don't have to give us a dollar, but percentage-wise, what 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 are you? How's the revenue of the business change or even the profit? Well, the critical thing, Stu, was you said we had to get to that fifty percent um, uh, net profit margin, and um, you know it's it's great it's great to uh, I guess report back to you that we are heading to that number. That's great. Um, which, which is which is great, but what it means is that you know we can afford more resources, we've got more time, um, and we can bring in a lot of the stuff that you've been, I guess, working with us on to improve the client experience, uh, yeah. more automation, uh, more time in my day, more time in the day of the staff that are helping me. Um, so that really is the end goal, to become a better practice once our finances are really rock solid. Um, I mean, I mean the, the, the revenue upkick is certainly a six figure number. Yep. Um, so, you know, we are tracking well and truly to, to that sort of metric. It's good because I think every business, even if you've been around for a while, if you're mature, everyone's kind of had to take a couple of steps backwards. So in many ways, everybody's back in growth mode. And the most important thing in growth mode, you need that, you need that profit to invest in hiring the right people, getting the right software, and you need the time. And you can't do that if you're, you're struggling to sort of deliver what you did before. So you guys are just now Like it's been so good to see you just get your head down and crack it. And I think you, I mean, you already had a lot of skill in this space anyway, so it kind of made it a lot easier. Um, let me just play out a few of the questions. Matt said, can you give a ballpark number? I'm, I'm not sure whether that means ballpark in terms of the conversation that was going on between the AMP practices about what their average number was. I yeah. The, the, the minimum that seems to be coming through, Stu, and, and this is you know, publicly available material from IFA and things like that, is that um, if you're charging $3,300 a year or less and you're looking to sell your book, um, you're not going to be paid for anybody at $3,300 a year or less. Um, right. The minimum benchmark seems to be $4,500 uh, a year per client to provide the you know, the full suite of services for clients. Um, so certainly that's been our minimum um, a, a, a going forward. Yep. But clearly, um, we are now targeting uh, much higher levels of income than that. Um, you've seen the Macquarie's and JB Weir's and a lot of the private bank people you know, charging minimum $10,000 plus. Yeah. Um, what we're doing is we're positioning ourselves for you know, seven and a half thousand dollars plus, and we're getting that uh, easily. Now, it's not happening by chance. It's back to the avatars that you know you and I set up back in March. It, it's targeting the right people, dealing with complexity, people who are time poor, and people who would value you know decent advice to get them from A to B. Um, so really they're the sorts of people you need to work with. So they've got a real definite goal in mind and they need some help with yep. that. Yeah, and right. you've got a compelling uh, service and advice offer, you know, so it's not just, you know, give your money to me and I'll look after you, but yeah. um, it's clearly delineated, identified, detailed, um, and they can see how you're going to actually take them from here to here to use that blue board analogy um, yeah. and how you're going to achieve it. So I'm, I'm very mindful of the time and I know some of you may have to go and if you've got to go, let me know as well, Daryl. But I wanted to give you the opportunity before, before I've got three questions if you've got time, I want to put them out there. I've got, I've got plenty but, of time, Stu. Sorry? I've got plenty of time. Okay. Like, give me an idea. Where, where, what, what's your next uh, phase? Where do you see yourself going? Where do you see the industry going over the next five years? I think the industry direction is pretty apparent. Um, I mean, numbers are falling, new entrants aren't uh, coming through in great numbers. Um, there's going to be further attrition and um, there's been hundreds of thousands of clients orphaned because advisors have left or they've been too small to provide yeah. ongoing service to. Um, I think the future is bright. I mean, I come back to you know our conversation we had about your IFA forum. 
presentation where 15% of the population is advised and 85% of the population is unadvised and, and people are, I guess, concerned about paying advisors $300 or $500 for initial advice. And I think part of that problem with the three or the $500 hurdle and people not wanting to pay that sort of money is they can't understand the value that we're providing them and their families. Um, it's multifaceted. So I spend a lot of time when I see someone dealing with their problems, you know, what's keeping them awake at night? What it, What is it that they um, want gone? You know, is it a debt issue? Is it a spending problem? You know, yeah. Uncertainty about retirement, whatever it is. So I dive down in there because once you dive down and you say, look, given our track record as an office, dealing with people all the way back to 1983 and taking them on that journey, we can solve your problems because we've done it for hundreds of people successfully yeah. for you. Um, that gives them confidence. And when they see, you know, the current six-figure six number they're at and the six-figure number you're going to take them to and yeah. your fee as a small part of that, yeah. it then puts it into context. 100%. They want to know that you can help them get the way they are. They want to know that um, there's some sort of guarantee that you wouldn't be well, you wouldn't be speaking to them if you didn't think you could help them. You wouldn't be quoting the fee. And secondly, that it's not a, a black box. And then you're going to show them how to do it. I couldn't agree more. Um, if, if, I know a couple of people are going to go. We've got to ask some questions. If, if people wanted to connect with you or find out more, I think go to Kogan and buy the book. What, what would you like people to do? LinkedIn, you know, get on, get on LinkedIn. I mean, there's a lot of advisors that connect with me. Um, you know, I make a lot of comments on LinkedIn on advice matters on Facebook. Uh, there's a group called uh, AZ Advisor um, that's um, been commenced by Andrew Melling. Uh, you know, get on there. Um, yeah, just search for me on LinkedIn, and um, I'm happy to help. I mean, I am the product of people like you, Stu, who have helped me get to where I've got to, and a lot of my peers, uh, MDRT. Um, and I'm willing to give back because I think that if um, people on this call can get some benefit from me, then their clients get the benefit. The advice profession is seen in a better light and collectively we all take the profession to a better level. I'm literally just putting together my presentation for the IFA Future Forum next Wednesday, which is in Sydney. If anybody wants to join me, it's a, it's a live thing before Christmas. And I, um, I, 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 I reflect on something I wrote six years ago in innovation, but I really believe it's like innovation in this industry is not coming from the institutions. They're not going to do it. We're going to do it. And I think when you sit down and you talk to practitioners who are building software, doing things, or, or they're just going down a certain route, if we can get that conversation going, we're going to see this innovation bubble up underneath. And then that's, that's where the change is going to come from. It's not going to come from industry associations. It's not going to come from institutions. It's an exciting time to be in it. So... Um, Anthony's asked a really great question. He's asked two. I'm going to start with the quick one, which is 50% profit. He wants to know, is it GP or NPAT? Um, that's NPAT. NPAT, cool. There you go. Uh, is the old service model of gold, silver, bronze, is it invalid? Is it done for? Yep, I think it is, Stu. And I mean, you turned on that light, light, light bulb for me just a few months ago when you said basically there's two, sorry, there's three types of clients. There's transactional, there's assist, and there's delegate. And that pretty much, um, you know, like we're seeing there, and I hadn't realized it, but that's essentially where the profession's been transformed to. I think the days of, you know, this is how much fun I've got, and therefore this is how much we're going to price. Um, is gone. I mean, maybe you might be able to maintain it, but I, um, I'm really a big subscriber in terms of what you've uh, articulated. I mean, even if you look at uh, online you know, offerings now, they don't even use it. They talk about business, pro, and basic because it's a, it's a usage case. Not a, it's just, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. And I think because of what's going on, like I, the IFA presentation I gave, there was a comment in there which I said, what are we going to do to target the 85%, which are the others? I've had three people reach out. Two of them are advisors who want to sell their business and they want to start something new. Another one is going in another direction. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting space. But, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's sort of done for. Um, Kim, good question. Any other tips that you can give for selling fees based on value and avoiding having to blame it on the government or legislation or, or other things? Or alternatively, Darrell, do you think, you think it's – it is a good thing to, to sort of blame it on the government. What do you, yeah, what, what's your advice? 
I think it's part of the conversation, the government and regulation. I think people need to be aware of, you know, how much work we're doing under the waterline. So I use the iceberg analogy where, you know, the, the, the piece above the waterline hasn't changed, but the portion under the waterline has got massively bigger. And I actually deliberately bring out the files and I, and I point out to the clients, you know, what work we have to do in the file, which doesn't add any value at all, you know, the client circumstances. But then I switch back to the value and the journey and what we're doing for them. So it's not even servicing, because I mean, that used to be, you know, we've done this work for you, we've spent X number of hours, you know, fixing it up, but it's more, you know, where you are now and where we're going to take you. Mm. And even the retirees, you know, people who are um, not really building wealth, but people who might be drawing on wealth or people who might be maintaining wealth, it's all about their future, you know, the aged care needs and maybe looking after kids and grandkids and leaving a legacy, having that conversation. And that, yeah. and that piece isn't finished. I mean, I mean, that's an ongoing piece. So it's not just, you know, we're looking after the investments and mm. you know, you're finally getting a decent return, but it's still looking ahead for people like that. I think that's that's a really key thing because it used to be this thing, this idea that once people got to retirement, they didn't have any other more goals. There's nothing else they wanted to do. And I think um, one of the great books I read about copywriting was Joanna Veeb's Copy Hackers. First page of it, she says, you're not selling a service, not selling a product, not selling a widget, not selling your expertise. You're selling a transformation. Everything on the planet, whether it's cars, you know, clothes, food, it's all about taking someone from a state that they are in to a state that they want to be in. And when people retire, they're still, I mean, they're still stressed. They're still... A, I don't want to have to worry about it. I want to be able to. So, yeah, I, I think that's a really, that's one of the key things I take away from this, which is if you are going to sell fees based on value, the value is in the transformation. And if you can have that transformation conversation and there's an agreement that the place they want to get to and the place they are now, there's a gap between the two and you are the person who can help them fill it with strategies, advice, support, all that sort of stuff, then that's where you can help them get to whatever their number is. Yeah. The other thing I say, student clients, are, just think of the changes that have occurred um, in um, Centrelink rules, in superannuation rules, in taxation rules since you've retired. And there's yeah. been more of these changes going forward. And we've got you through every time there's been a change to ensure you're in the best possible place you can be. I mean, just to give you an example, um, you saw the APRA. Uh, comparison rules that came out um, on the my super funds back in September and a lot of our clients are in you know Asgard they're in CFS they're in BT and these funds were actually named as underperforming funds so mm. clients pick up the newspaper and they see BT's being named as an underperforming fund now my clients are in BT they email me they call me and they say Daryl my fund's underperforming what am I going to do and I'm saying well, not your fund, a BT fund, but your fund's okay. If it's not, you're going to be getting a letter from BT shortly saying you need to get out. Nice. Right. You can get their letter. So it's putting it in some context. Being yeah. For them. Beautiful. Um, at least I know you asked a question there, but I think I, I just got a, a bracket. But uh, look, um, do me a favor. Um, I really appreciate everyone staying on. Can you do me a favor? Just put it in the chat box. What's the number one thing that you've taken? from this that you've uh, appreciated, that the insight that you'll take, or even better, the number one thing that you, you think you can take and use, whether you're talking fees with a client because of a transition or some other reason. While you do that, I'm just gonna ask this question from Brian. What's the number one thing you think you can do better in order to get the message across to clients that you're, we are adding value as, a, as, as individuals, as an industry? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, clients either pay us for delegating or assisting them or they DIY and um, there's a lot of DIY people out there and um, they do it you know well um, there's not one DIY person who I haven't dealt with in my 24 years as an advisor where I haven't been able to make an improvement to their circumstances mm -hmm. however they haven't actually engaged me and the reason they haven't engaged me is because there hasn't been a call to action. In other words, yes, there's been an improvement. I could have cut their taxes. I could have improved their rates of return, but it wasn't going to make a big difference in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and they were quite happy doing it themselves. And there are a lot of people who, you know, haven't got a gardener, haven't got a cleaner, eat out at restaurants, you know, but there are other people um, that choose to do that. 
So I think what we've got to be uh, cognizant of, of as a profession is that some people will use our services and others will not, but they mm. might engage with us and get some validation of you know where they are and, 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 that, and that's it. Um, so I think all we can do is look to continually do what we've done and kept you know hundreds of our clients happy year in year out and that will uh, appeal to a large proportion of the outsourced uh, clients out there who are happy to you know give you stuff to get done i love it love it everybody i'd love to know what you have taken from this session just give us a little bit of feedback i know i i have a very high need for feedback so i appreciate it but um, any final thoughts? Uh, for, for, yeah, Dara, any final thoughts? Look, I mean, um, people are sitting on a mountain of value. Um, all they have to do is to articulate it, to deliver it. And the one thing I'd say to people on this uh, webinar is to ask their clients what they've actually valued mm. from using the services of all the people on the webinar. Um, you know, have a have a honest conversation with them. They wouldn't be a client. They wouldn't be paying you money if they weren't getting any value. Get that in their words. And the reason that is important is because then you can use these same words when you're engaging with a new prospect, because then you're talking their language, because they're looking for similar things. Um, and then the prospect will get the value, because that's what they're looking for. Love it. That's perfect. I've taken so much from this. Uh, I have taken um, the, the the taking complexity to sim, uh, sim, to sim, uh, simple using the familiar. That's been a big big thing. Uh, I think another thing I took from it is um, just understanding that the, actually the mechanism behind your fast trash and, uh, transition was really really key to me. Um, Brian, thanks for a great session. Very well articulated, Daryl. As I had expected. Yeah, you don't. That's pretty much what you get when you speak to Daryl. Um, Elisa said, I think she took um, she took a lot on how to put the value forward. Nobby, it's always about the transformation. The cost to get there is secondary. It's important enough. I, I really do believe that because if, if it was always about the price, then everybody would not be spending money on stuff they don't need. Ultimately, wants overrides need every single time. Um, so if you can understand what people want and then sort of park your ability to help them get what's good for them next to it, then you sort of get in the same way. Daryl, thank you so much for this. I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, I appreciate you sort of giving your time. And uh, everybody else who came along, thank you so much for being part of it. If you have any questions, please do connect with Daryl on, on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, get in contact, have a bit of a chat. But other than that, got anything planned for the weekend, Daryl? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's good to uh, have some downtime and uh, spend time with my dog and going for walks. and. Um, it was my son's first game of cricket uh, on Saturday, but with all the rain in Melbourne, I think that's gone wow. out the door. Um, he was going to be playing for the Bentley first uh, as a 19-year-old. That's a pretty good uh, step yeah, up, right. and uh, looks like the weather might have got the better of him. But anyway, it's, 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 the, the, same, it's the same here. Honestly, it's been bucketing. I put the I put we got a, one of those small you know pools you put in the backyard, and I put it. I think I put it about on Saturday, and it's pretty much filled itself. So we're yeah. planning on going down to Canberra. We'll see how it goes. Daryl, thank you so much for, for the webinar. Thank you for, for, for giving me the opportunity to work with you. And I'm really looking forward to 2022 because we've got some work to do on client experience. And on top of that, I really feel that the wind's going to change in the next 12 months. So yep. everybody, thank you so much. Enjoy your weekend, uh, whatever you're doing, and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Take care. Thank you, Stuart.